so in the previous chapter, if you were with us in Galatians chapter three and really throughout the, 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 uh, uh, the first three chapters of the book of Galatians, you know that Paul had explained uh, very well what salvation came through and that of course being the promise found in Abraham, not through the law that was found through Moses 430 years later. And uh, in this, he told us that we are heirs of Christ. And all that is found in Galatians chapter three. In Galatians 3, 29, uh, there at the end of the chapter, he said, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if you've accepted Christ, as your Lord and Savior, you've now become an heir to the inheritance of salvation. And now as Paul has, has, has explained very well that the promise is through the, uh, that, the, that salvation and the inheritance is through the promise found in Abraham, he now explains to us in chapter four what exactly that means. And it's so awesome how systematically he goes through the doctrine of grace throughout the book of Galatians. And as I've said before, it is such an important book. And I encourage you guys to study and read and know the book of Galatians. In chapter four, let's read it again, verses one through three. It says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. And if you have children, if you have kids at all, you know exactly what Paul is talking about, right? Paul says that though they are masters of all. Sometimes we look at our children and we go, yeah, that's the master of the home, right? He rules and reigns the home. You know, as I look at Luke and I just follow him around the house all day long, not all day, but you know, when I'm home and I'm just walking behind him, making sure he doesn't fall over, you know, into a table. I'm like, man, this is, this is, you know, what it is. You know, we just give up our hours, right? And our days and just everything for our children. They are just master of all. But yet when they are a child, Paul says that they are under that bondage. They're under the elements of the world, right? Yes, he, is ma- he will be one day master of, of uh, all of my fortune, right? What fortune there is. But yet as he is a child, uh, he is under the rules of the house, right? Though he doesn't like it, he has to be in bed by nine o'clock. And though he fights and screams and yells, he knows he has to be in bed by nine o'clock. No matter how much grace we have on him, right? As I tell my wife, I think he just wants to lay on the couch and watch TV with dad tonight. You know, oh, no, he needs to go to bed. You know, there's mom. But uh, so Paul begins to draw the picture between uh, being a child and being under the law and really drawing a contrast between being in bondage and under the law and being free under Christ. This is what Paul is speaking about. He begins with the picture of a child that is one day going to receive all that the father has for him. He says like a child that will one day be master of all, but while he's a child is under the responsibility of others. And he says that it's no different than the servant that's responsible for him, right? That servant that also is under certain responsibilities, under certain bondage from the master. And in verse three, read it with me again. Paul says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So we were, as that child, under certain guardians, under certain restrictions before the promise of Christ came into effect is what Paul is saying. But listen to the way that he says it. It's neat the way he says it. He says, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. You hear how restrictive it sounds, right? You were in bondage. You were bound. You were held captive. It just sounds like we were just tied up by certain aspects of the world, those elements Paul points to. It's interesting how apart from Christ, the world thinks that they're so free, right? 
They think, oh, we have so much freedom apart from religion, apart from this Christ that you guys speak about, and we get to do whatever it is that we want to do. And before we came to Christ, a lot of us had that same idea. We had no idea, really, of the bondage that we were really in, the restrictions that sin really had us captive to, the law that really had us bound. And in reality, we were slaves to that sin. We were held captive by the law. The law bound us. And we go, oh, you know, yeah, we could stop any time. We could kick that, you know, habit or whatever. Really? Well, then do it. Oh, you know, I just don't want to right now. You know, and we come up with all the excuses. But really, it's the law that held us in captive or, or captivity to that sin. And it's the, it constantly proclaimed our sin is what it did. As we were apart from Christ before the promise and we were held under the law, what that law did is it proclaimed constantly our sin to the world and to us. We were bound to it. And that's why you had so many burnt offerings, right? So many different offerings in the Old Testament that are spoken about. Five specifically, you had the burnt offerings, you had the grain offerings, you had the peace offerings, you had the sin offerings, and you had the trespass offerings, all these different offerings that constantly had to be made to the Lord because of the sin that was so rampant within people's lives, because the law was constantly bringing that sin to light. What kind of freedom is that? Apart from Christ, we're in bondage to what is required of us, that law that just continually requires, regardless uh, of if you want to accept that requirement of, or not. We are in bondage to it, and it continually requires something of us. Verse four, going on, it says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So while the world was enslaved under sin or to sin under the law that could not save them or could not save us, God, in his perfect timing, sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, that we might be set free. And that the freedom that came through Jesus Christ only, through, through, uh, uh, through, his, uh, through the cross, and for us, under the law, it came through a woman that was also under the law, just like us, Paul says. That we might be, he uses that word, adopted, into the Lord's family. Underline or circle that word in your Bible. He says that we've been adopted. And you know, some people treat Christianity like they're merely foster children. You know, that word foster means to encourage or to promote the development of something. If you foster something, you're developing it, right? Kind of like a foster child. You're wanting to develop or wanting to uh, encourage that child. Uh, you're caring for them. And some people come to Christ and they treat their Christianity like they're mere foster children, like they're being uh, developed, like, they're, like they, they come to Christ just uh, to better themselves, to create something positive within them. You know, like, oh, I'm just gonna be staying a while and, and, and you know, until I receive something that I'm in need of and, and once I do, I'll move on to the next family, kind of like that foster child does, you know, but God uh, doesn't have foster children. Paul doesn't say that Christ came that we would be foster children of the Lord. He says that we might be adopted, that we might be adopted as children. That word adopt means to legally take ownership of. And when you think of an adopted child, it's in such contrast from a foster child. And if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are now legally his. You are now his adopted child, not his foster child, 
you're not just here for a short time for the Lord to work on you and, and develop you so you can move on and go to something different. You are legally his and, and his forever. And Christ treats us as biological children. The adopted child doesn't have to earn anything or doesn't have to earn their adoption by doing anything, by any act. And because we've been adopted by Christ, We've also become heirs to the riches of Christ, just like that adopted child is heirs to the riches of their adopted parents. And what is it that we're getting? Well, the covenant that was made with Abraham is found in Genesis in chapter 15, if you wanna write that there in your Bible in Galatians 4. And in Genesis 15, 1, God said, do not be afraid, Abram. He said, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So first off, God starts off with Abraham that he is his shield. He starts off with Abraham, do not be afraid. And also Abraham, I am your great reward. So, so many things that come from the promise of God. And he goes on in chapter 15 to explain it a little further. Abraham goes on to tell God that because he's childless, because him and Sarah have not been able to have children, that the Uh, that the inheritance will end up going to one of his slaves, one of his servants, speaking of Eleazar of Damascus. And God says uh, there in chapter 15 in Genesis that no slave will inherit his riches. He says, Abraham, your riches are not going to go to a slave. They're not going to go to a foster child. Abraham, your riches, your inheritance will go to a child, a natural born child of your house, speaking of Isaac. And just as the Hebrew was heir to the Lord, God saw that the Hebrew was not a natural born child to the Lord. And so he paved the way for us to become adopted children setting up the inheritance that it would not go to a servant, it would not go to a slave, it would not go to somebody that is merely a foster child or somebody that is, uh, uh, you know, that is not um, uh, living uh, worthy of the inheritance as an adopted child, but it is somebody that has been adopted into the house of Christ, somebody that is legally a son or a daughter of Christ. And as the chapter goes on there in Genesis 15, God tells Abraham to make preparations for the covenant that, w- that he was preparing to, uh, 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 to go through with Abraham, to make between him and Abraham. And Abraham uh, brought the Lord three, uh, he brought him a three-year-old heifer, it says. It says that he brought him a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon, and he cuts uh, all of these animals in half, and he places them on opposite sides of each other, and as he lays them down, uh, they would walk through the path that it would make, and the covenant would become binding or legal between God and Abraham, and in verse 17 of Genesis 15, it says, and it came to pass when the sun went down, And it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river Euphrates to the great river, the river, or let me say that again, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So as the time came for the covenant, Abraham, he ends up getting very tired. Uh, It says a little bit before that, that Abraham falls into a deep sleep. He ends up falling asleep and the Lord is the one that ends up passing through these animals. And it's okay because the Lord was the only one that something was required of for this covenant to take place. In Galatians 4, 8 through 11, it says this. It says, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, Least I have labored for you 
in vain. There's nothing more sad than a believer who once walked with the Lord but decided, decided to turn back to the beggarly elements of the world, that decided to turn back to the things of the world and leave the freedom that they found in the Lord. They leave the freedom of the Lord and they return to the captivity of the world, that bondage that they were delivered from. And before the Galatians heard and believed in Christ, they were serving themselves. They were serving themselves. Everything that they did was for themselves. Everything that we do before we come to the Lord is for ourselves. It's in our own flesh. We served the world. We served idols. We served men. Even in our religion, even in the law, we serve men rather than the Lord. And Paul says, those by, uh, which by nature are not gods. So those which are not God by nature and are simply men or simply the flesh. And as the Galatians began to uh, get back into the religious works of the Jews, they began to uh, believe what the Jew had come down into Galatia and spoke to them. They began to go back to these uh, beggarly elements of the world, as Paul says, and they begin to serve those things which by nature are not God's. And what was it? It says that they were keeping, uh, they were looking to the days, the months, the seasons, and the years, keeping the Sabbath, following the feasts of the sabbatical year, you know, every seven years, and, and, and having to do all of the things that the law required of them. And Paul says, man, I'm afraid for you guys. I'm afraid that everything that the Lord did thus far was all in vain. I'm afraid that it was all for nothing. He worries that all the victories that they had in Christ were all for nothing. In Colossians 2.16, it says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. So according to God, the day that you worship, what you wear when you worship, where you are when you worship does not matter. All of these things is not what the Lord is looking for, but what matters is your heart. What matters is your sincerity. What matters is who you are worshiping. And what religion does is it takes away from what matters and it gives to what doesn't. All of the importance It pulled away from God and it put it on the things that don't even matter. The Galatians didn't turn back to the world and and, and to sin. They didn't turn back, you know, to, uh, 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 to old sin that they struggled with, but they turned back to religion. They gave up the freedom of worshiping God for the bondage that is found in meaningless acts. All the religion that they turned back to, it was just heartless, meaningless traditions. And this is what they turned to. And every day, we're so close to giving up grace for the law. Every day, uh, we need to guard ourselves against the lies of the bondage of the law. You know, making sure that we're not taking from what matters and giving to what doesn't matter. The have-tos. You know, every day as we Uh, if it's not Christ that we're centered on, if it's not Christ that we're looking to, if it's not the grace that is found in the Lord, then we have to be careful that it's not the law and works that we're basing our salvation on. Going on, verse 12 says, Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore uh, become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth, they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when when I am present with you. 
my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone for I have doubts about you. At this point, Paul makes a personal plea to the Galatians. He speaks directly from his heart. Uh, He says, hey Galatians, what a beautiful relationship we had. Remember the times that I came to you. Remember the moments that we had. Remember the times that we sat down and spoke freely and how, we, and, and how much I loved you. He says, I came to you and we just had such a good time. He says, I became like you, me being a Jew, you being a Gentile. He says, you would have even plucked out your own eyes for me and, and handed them over to me in my infirmities, but making some believe that Paul had uh, vision problems, if not being blind. Basically, Paul's saying, look, I'm telling you the truth because I love you. I'm telling you the truth, not because of any ulterior motive, not because of any self-gain, not for any other reason, but because I love you guys. And you sometimes, it's nice to just hear, I love you. Sometimes it's nice to just set aside all the arguments and, and all the things that we try to battle with and, and just say, look, I'm simply coming to you because I, I, I just completely care about you. And this is what Paul is speaking about right now to the Galatians. He says, it's good to be zealous for good things always and not only when I'm present with you. Basically, hold on to what you've learned. Hold on to the good that you found in Christ, not just when the person of accountability is present with you. Sometimes when we have that person that we're accountable to, that mentor, you know, the one that, that, that uh, holds us responsible, we're on our best behavior, and then when that person isn't present, we go back to the, to the old ways. Paul says, no, be zealous for the Lord. Be zealous for those good things, whether I'm present or whether I'm, whether I'm gone. Always on your toes. Why? Because the Lord is always present. Verse 19 and 20, he said, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. You know, through, uh, through childbirth, blood and sweat and tears, are also born, right? It's not just the child, but it's the pain and the suffering and everything that just comes along with it. And, and Paul here is saying that he's laboring. He's in labor like that mother bringing a child into this world, the passion that is behind it. And sometimes, you know, we need to just have that love that Paul had for the Galatians. It's such love that we see here. And it's just so neat to see uh, because sometimes we just, need to, we just need to have that for one another. You know, too many times Christians are known for what they're against rather than what they're for. And we're always known for battling the scriptures. We're always known for, for you know, s- saying what, what you need us not do rather than just bringing the love of Christ into the ordeal or into the situation. You know, Christ battled so much with the religious leaders. He spoke so much about scripture and, and he let them know truly what, you know, what truth was. But eventually it came time for him to stop talking and to just take action. And that was love. The action that Christ took in the end, that was love. You want to know what love is? Love is that, a man hanging on a tree, becoming cursed for the ones that he loves. Eventually, it was no more arguments, but it was just, here I am. Here's my body for you, void of all selfishness. And I would stand behind anyone in this church that is in leadership or that is a a part of ministry, and I would stand here and tell you, it is because they love you. It is because they love the Lord, and a lot of times it is because they love you for the most part. It's not easy coming up and telling somebody the truth, right? In fact, we want to avoid it as much as possible. But the ones that do, they do it out of love. And Paul wrote the book of Galatians out of love for those that he was writing to. Verse 21 says, tell me, 
You who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. Speaking of Hagar and Sarah, right? As God promised Abraham many, many descendants, uh, Sarah took it into her own hands, if you know the story, and offered up her servant Hagar uh, to Abraham, right? And, uh, and this was, of course, a work of the flesh as we see what Sarah did with Abraham and, and with her servant. And why? Because it was outside of the will of God. It was outside of what God wanted to do. Abraham and Sarah, they knew, they understood the promise that God had for him that he had brought to them, but they didn't understand the sovereignty of God. They didn't understand that God was uh, uh, able, that God was all powerful, that he was com- it was completely possible for him to fulfill the promise that was at hand and instead they wanted to do a work of the flesh and they wanted to take things into their own hands and get things done. Pretty much they were saying, I can do it better. I can do it quicker. In verse 23 and 24 it says, but he who was of the bondwoman, speaking of Ishmael or the law, was born according to the flesh And he of the free woman, speaking of Isaac or grace, through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, speaking of Moses and the law, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. And uh, so basically anything that is outside of the promise, anything that is of the law, anything that is of the flesh uh, gives birth to bondage is what Paul is saying here. He says, "For uh, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which is the law, which is the flesh, gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Anything apart from Christ, anything apart from the promise, all it gives birth to, all it does is bring bondage. So many times we just want to work out the things of Christ. We want to work out the promise. We want to take things into our own hands. I know better. I can get it done better. I can get it done quicker. And really all we're doing is we're just messing things up, right? We're just messing up the whole situation and God's whole plan. And what we're doing is we're bringing things into bondage. Verse 25 says, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. And so Paul is just using a lot of pictures, right? A lot of analogies here. So trying to keep it all clear for us. But he says, uh, let's read it again. He says, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. Speaking of Jerusalem there in their time, Paul's present day Jerusalem, and is in bondage with her children. So Jerusalem in the time of Paul was, uh, was run by the law, right? It was run by religion, Paul is saying. And, and boy, were they in bondage. Jerusalem was completely in bondage physically under Roman law, right? As Rome ruled the land there and spiritually under the law of the Jewish religion. The same way that Rome wants to uh, everyone to be under control, the religious leaders wanted everybody to be under their control. And it's through religion that freedom in the Lord is stolen and turned into control by men from the very, very beginning of time. It's just this cycle that continues on, this control by men that they want to use religion and they'll even use the name of God in order to implement. You know, control by religion is a completely man-made concept. It was never intended by the Lord. The Lord never desired for men to have control uh, by his word. And it started by men who pervert the gospel of God for their own gain. And any time control is implemented, the spirit is hindered. 
Anytime man implements control or religion or puts his own rules and laws on things, right away the, the spirit is just completely hindered within that situation. And that's why it's so important for us as believers to step aside and let the Lord work rather than set so many laws that are a lot of times and rules that a lot of times are impossible to be met. Paul is not preaching about control. Paul's preaching about freedom is what he's speaking about. Freedom to love, freedom to accept the Lord. And that, uh, that adopted child that we looked at, you know, do we see that adopted child as a slave once they're adopted to their parents? No. You know, do we see them as in bondage to their parents? No. We look at them as loved. We look at them as set free from the bondage of the system that they came out of. We see them as free. And we see the opportunity even that is given to them. That's what this child is seen as. And that's what we see us as, as we are adopted children of the Lord. We are set free in Christ. No longer foster children to this world. No longer in bondage to the system of this world that the law brings upon us. But we're now free to love. We're now free to accept Christ and we're now free to live fully in the promise that he has for us. Verse 26 there in Galatians says, but the Jerusalem above is free. Speaking of the promise, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, And if you look at Isaiah 55, this is where Paul takes this from. And Paul quotes uh, Isaiah here, and he says, Rejoice, O barren. And in the book of Isaiah, it is speaking of Israel in that time as they're in captivity or going into captivity. And in this time, Paul would use it to relate to the believer. So again, he says, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, speaking to the believer, Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for the, de- for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. And though it may seem like the world is rich, and the world uh, uh, has so much more than the church, and the church is poor, God says to rejoice and to shout because we have the promise. He says, rejoice, O barren. The promise is where hope is found. And back in the book of Isaiah, in the next few verses in verse five, in chapter 54, Isaiah says, for the maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. You know, I am my wife's husband, but only for a moment, only for a moment in time. The Lord is her true husband, is what Paul is saying. And how dare me disrespect my spouse in any way when she is not mine to disrespect? How dare me not love my spouse in any way, when she is not mine, to not love. Paul says, the maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is, the call, he is called the God of the whole earth. Verse 21, Paul says, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Paul's asking, do you not understand the alternative to the Lord? Do you know what you're asking for? Do you understand what what you're asking for? You're asking to be put back under the law. Do you even know what the law requires of you? Do you understand the works of the law and, 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 and what it requires to be fulfilled? See, we have a choice, right? To either be a church and to be believers that rest in the Lord that rest in the promise of the Lord, that put the emphasis on the word of God, that put the emphasis on getting to know God, 
that put our time into reading his word, that put our time and our effort in prayer and in the freedom that he brings, or to be believers that are focused on the works of our hands and how much we can accomplish with our hands, how much we can accomplish physically. And I would say that if you're not falling in love with Jesus daily, if you're not reading his word daily, if you're not praying to him daily, if you don't have that life with Christ, that you are in danger of reverting back to the law or works. This is where the Galatians were. They chose Christ and they forgot all about his grace. They went back to works. What can I do now? And this is the same position that we are in every single day. We accept Christ, but then do we go back to the works of our hands? Gotta get there on time. Gotta be a part of that ministry. Gotta go out and pick weeds. Gotta, gotta, gotta. Instead of focusing on the grace that is found in the Lord and the relationship that we get to have with him. And you know, we're not dumb. I think we know if we're honest with ourselves, if we truly have that relationship with Christ, if we have a healthy relationship with the Lord. And if not, how do we get there? You know, we get there through his word. God speaks to us through his word. Too many believers do not go through the word of God on a daily basis. Too many believers do not read the word of God one-on-one between them. They come to church and they expect to receive uh, what, everything that they need to receive from a speaker, from a pastor. And really it's that relationship, that one-on-one relationship that God is just sitting back waiting to have with you. Waiting for you to come to him. Waiting for you to just open up his word and say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak to me, God. Verse 28 says, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, speaking of Ishmael, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, speaking of Isaac, even so it is now. So there uh, is a constant battle between the flesh and the spirit, right? Even as we saw a constant battle between Ishmael and Isaac, uh, the same as the law and grace. Ishmael and Isaac were at odds with one another as brothers are a lot of time, right? And Ishmael began to rise up against Isaac. He began to pester him. He began to mock him. And it's interesting that grace doesn't force you to abandon the law. Grace never forces you to abandon the law. All it does is it gives you a means to fulfill it. It lets you fulfill the requirements of the law, but the law will always force you to abandon grace. When you come to grace through faith in Christ, you don't abandon, you know, not lying or not stealing or the things that the law has for us. Really what it does is, uh, you know, you cling to it almost. You just start to be, you begin to do, to do it naturally now. And there's this constant pull from the world to leave the freedom from the Lord, the freedom that is found in grace. There's a constant pull from the law to leave what we have in the Lord. And verse 30 says, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So the story found in Genesis 21 speaks of Ishmael mocking Isaac. And Sarah tells Abraham that, she, that he needs to send Ishmael away. He needs to get rid of Ishmael and Hagar. And he, she says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. Why? Because the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. God had a specific promise 
for the heir of Abraham, for the son of promise. And that promise had nothing to do with the heir of the, of the bondwoman, had nothing to do with Ishmael. And it was one of the hardest decisions that Abraham would have to make. He had to get rid of one of his sons. It wasn't an easy thing for him to do. It was very difficult for him to do, but there was no other way. He had to choose between bondage or between freedom because bondage will eat away at freedom. That's all it will do. Bondage will continue to eat away and to battle and to come up and to rise against grace. And so we have to make the choice between freedom found in grace through faith or the bondage that is found in the flesh or works. And just as difficult as it was for Abraham to cast out the bondwoman, it's also difficult for us, for many believers to cast out the law. It really is. And it's so much easier to focus on what we can do rather than focus on what he's already done. And I know in Calvary, we have such an emphasis on grace. But again, it is so unique to Calvary. It is so unique to Christianity and it's only found within true Christianity. It is not found uh, outside of true Christianity. Freedom always comes at a cost, doesn't it? You know, it cost Abraham Ishmael. It cost him one of his sons. Really, it did. But the promise, the prize that came from freedom, from the promise that the Lord had for him, well outweighed everything that Abraham had to give up. And God was still gonna take care of Ishmael. He promised Abraham. He's still gonna, he even told Abraham, I'm still gonna make him a great nation. And he did. And the world and its religious tactics will not partake of any of the Lord's inheritance. It will not partake of any of the Lord's promise. It's something that he saved for only his children, for only his adopted children, only those that have been adopted into his family. And as Ishmael left, and as God told Abraham, uh, Abraham, I'm gonna make Ishmael still a great nation. There will still be many that come from Ishmael. There is still today, unfortunately, many that will always follow the bondwoman. Many that will always follow the law. In fact, there are more so that will follow the law, we are told, than those that will follow grace and those that will follow the promise because wide is the road that leads to destruction. Many are those that go in by it. Those that think they have anything to do with their own salvation. Those that think they can affect their salvation in any way. Those that think they can work out the will of God rather than letting him simply do the work. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He says we are his workmanship. We're his peace. He wants to be the one that does the work. He doesn't want us to be the one doing the work. He wants to want be the one. We are his workmanship. But I know I can beat this. No, you can't. But if I just try hard enough, you'll be trying your whole life. Give up and let God do the work. Paul said, therefore, you are no longer a slave, in verse seven, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. God has taken you out of slavery and not only set you free, but he accepted you into his home. He not only accepted you into his home, but he made you a son or daughter. And now you have access to the father as a son or daughter, no longer having the restrictions of a slave, no longer having the restrictions of a servant, but having the freedom that comes with being a child of Christ. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, we just uh, are so grateful, Lord, for the freedom that is found in you, God. And Lord, in agreement, Father, we just thank you that, Lord, you decided to adopt us as children, Lord.